Hi, I'm Gary Burton, and I'm going to be answering your questions on the studio. I called out to my sister. No, that's not an E flat. It's supposed to be an E natural. Perfect pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Burton grip gang. My response is, uh, you know, it makes me feel good. <laughs> Other countries that I like uh, include Australia, in fact. Yes. If you want to get work easy, play the bass. That's what we always say, because every band needs a bass player, and there are never enough of them for some yes. reason. Why did you shave the stash? Oh, my mustache. Well, everybody has an important role, and even the poor lone viola player is always overlooked. And there is the Burton grip, which I have to say, you know, I didn't invent it. It's not every day you meet someone who said they won a marimba competition in front of Claire Musser. <laughs> So this is really surreal for me. Please share this comment with him. Your grip is the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might end up writing a, a, a murder mystery or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you should make a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very special episode of The Studio. Today, we have a very special guest answering all of your questions. It's none other than Gary Burton. Hi, I'm Gary Burton, and I'm going to be answering your questions on The Studio. Thank you so much to my studio VIPs, Robert Utomo, Will Flinner, Ryan Carlisle, Sang Shin Han, Greg Harris, Dom Zong Yichung, DP Newberger, and Scott Rader. Thank you so much for your continued support. And today's featured studio artist is Hayden. Thank you so much for your continued support. If you'd like to become a studio VIP or a studio artist, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Adam Tan, or you can click over here. Welcome back to the show once again. Hope you've been doing well. Hope you're staying safe. And today's episode is an absolute banger. Today we have the one and only Gary Burton answering your questions that you submitted to me via Facebook and Instagram on the channel, on the studio show today. It's absolutely ridiculous. But I have to say firstly, thank you so much to Gary Burton for wanting to do this with us. It's a really, really great opportunity for us to learn from someone who really has seen it all. Now I'm assuming most of you guys know who Gary Burton is, but if you don't, Gary is one of the greatest and most quintessential vibraphone players in our time right now. He's been around for such a long time. His performing career spans over 60 something years and he only retired three years ago at the age of 74. 74. And also in his 60 plus year performing career, Gary has collaborated with so many people so many people like Keith Jarrett, Stan Getz, Asto Piazzolla, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, obviously, Makoto Ozone more recently. Just awesome, awesome people that he's collaborated with, literally spanning multiple generations. I don't think there's anything that Gary hasn't done. In fact, in addition to being fully self-taught from a young age, he actually won a marimba competition at the age of six, and the judge was Claire Omar Massa. What? And yes, because we received so many questions from you guys, understandably, because it's Gary Burden, <laughs> we thought it would be a shame if Gary had to rush his answers or like cut off important parts so that he could fit within a specific time frame. So we actually decided to pick certain questions from you guys, and Gary's actually gonna answer them over multiple videos. So don't worry, if Gary didn't answer your question in today's video, you'll probably see it in the next one. And if you wanna see when the next one comes out, make sure you hit that red subscribe button below to keep up with my uploads and hit that notification bell to know whenever I upload a new episode. And one more thing, I have put question timestamps in the description and also in the pinned comment down below. So if you'd like to focus more on a specific question first, you can just skip to that question down below. But I would recommend watching the full interview. It's an absolute eye opener. So without further ado, here's Gary Burton. Gary Burton, thank you so much for joining us on the studio show. It's a huge honor to have you here. That's my pleasure, Adam. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, seeing the questions from your uh, your followers. <laughs> yes, they've been very keen to ask you all kinds of questions. You are one of the greatest, most legendary players that anyone could ever meet in this day and age. Since you've retired, have you picked up any new hobbies or skills or languages or anything that is not related to vibraphone at all? In fact, my intention when I retired was to uh, leave my life in music and do something new, you know, with uh, the next portion of my life. That was three years ago. And uh, I had a hobby all along of raising bonsai trees. So I, oh. of course, Florida is perfect weather for gardening. Yes. And, uh, so I have my collection that I'm trimming and watering and taking care of. I That's also uh, 
have recently started studying Vietnamese, the language. Because my partner wow. is, uh, is Vietnamese, though he speaks wonderful English. Uh, we have a lot of Vietnamese friends and acquaintances, and we're planning to make a trip to Vietnam once the virus has been brought under control. So I thought, well, this would be a good project. I finished the beginner segment of the course, and I'm in the middle <laughs> of the intermediate. Oh, it's getting harder. Are you but, able to uh, have conversations with all, all the Vietnamese friends yet? No. Well, I, of course, I don't see any of the friends yet because we're still uh, That's true. staying at home. But uh, oh. I practice with Dustin, um, you know, every now and then. I'm just at the point where I can start making short sentences and ask, you know, how are you and what are you doing, Fantastic. that sort of thing. But uh, as soon as he answers, I, I, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> have you been using like an online course to study or is it more yes, just I've been, I'll give it a plug because I think it's really well done is the Rosetta Stone sort of oh Rosetta that's level. hardcore that's the well, highest uh, level when I reviewed all these courses I it was considered the the gold standard yes and, uh, and it's all in Vietnamese there's no English fantastic you have to, full you know, immersion in, in immersion style and yes. actually, that's been working pretty well for me. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> still making progress. I worried if, that it would be harder for a, somebody of my age. I mean, I'm, I'm an old guy here. Uh, would I have trouble, um, you know, keeping up? That's what I'm doing. Otherwise, um, I've rediscovered cooking because Fantastic. we're home all the time. So we do a lot of cooking together. And, what kind uh, of food do you cook it. now? Uh, Dustin cooks Asian food a lot because he's okay. Asian. I grab recipes out of the newspapers and online. Oh, and fantastic. if anything that looks like it only takes a half an hour to put together, uh, then, you know, and I check to make sure we've got the ingredients. Uh, it's one oh. of those things that takes four hours of special skills that forget it. But uh, <laughs> Anything that's convenient. You know. <laughs> so you've been self-taught since you were young, and I know that you started playing marimba around eight years old. And can you tell me a little bit about meeting Claire Omar Musser at the age of eight? Like, that's crazy. The fact that you taught yourself and you also got to the level that you won a prize in the competition for Musser, that blows my mind. So give us a little bit of a story about that. I started playing when I was six. People often ask me, why the vibraphone? How, how on earth did you choose the vibraphone? And I grew up in a, you know, in a small towns in Indiana. No one even knew what a vibraphone was. My parents wanted all three of us children to have the chance to take music lessons. And my older sister had started playing the piano when I, she, she was two years older. And when I, I started hanging around while she was practicing, annoying her and uh, constantly ask questions or jump in and comment and stuff. And one day I was in the kitchen and my sister was practicing and my father noticed that I called out to my sister, no, that's not an E flat, it's supposed to be an E natural. Oh, perfect pitch. <laughs> <laughs> he noticed that and said, oh, maybe we should find an instrument for Gary. So it had to be something other than the piano. And, yeah. So they took me to a few recitals of different instruments. It turned out there was a lady in that town, where we were living then, uh, who gave lessons on the marimba and vibraphone. My mother called her up. She lived like 10 minutes away from our house. Drove me over. Don't remember this, but my mother said that the entire time we were at the teacher's house, I refused to pick up the mallets or anything. I just sat there on the stool, <laughs> you know, frozen. The, so the teacher said, well, he, maybe he's not ready yet. Come back in a year or two. My mother said, we went home and all I did was talk about that instrument for the next two weeks. And she, she said, okay, okay, okay. And she took me back. I remember still my first piece that I learned that day was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Oh yeah. You know, this is one of the things that I, point out, I always point out to mallet players is you don't realize it, but you're playing the easiest instrument to learn to play in existence. You don't have to develop a tone. Uh, you don't have to worry about being in tune. You don't have to condition your lips, calluses, or your fingers or anything. You, the notes are in front of you and you hit it with a stick. 
I mean, it's as simple. It's always simple. right. <laughs> so you can play an easy tune, you know, right away and feel like, wow, you know, it works. Whereas yeah. if you were starting off on any other instrument, it would be squeaks and honks and, and fumbling. <laughs> I took lessons with uh, this lady, Evelyn was her name, for about a year and a half. And then we moved 200 miles away to another very small town. So I didn't have uh, any instruction after that. I had just gotten sort of barely started. But, I, mm. you know, she had taught me how to read the notes. So I just kept on learning songs. So I Age eight, we got word that uh, there was going to be this sort of marimba convention in the state of Illinois, not far, a few hours away from where I was living. And it was organized by Claire Musser, who was then the president of the Musser Company, the largest uh, mallet company. And he himself, everyone knows, played marimba and vibraphone and wrote pieces. Mm -hmm. One of his jobs, besides having the company, was to try to popularize, introduce the marimba and the vibraphone to more people. And so he was a good ambassador, sort of charismatic character. Long story short, we went to the convention. It was called the National Marimba Contest. People came from all over the country to uh, perform, and eventually there were different categories of, of performers. And I was in the youth category, and I won first prize. Uh, there you go. I don't remember. I don't remember what piece I played, and I and it was Claire Musser who I still have a photograph somewhere of him handing me this little trophy. Um, I still have the trophy. Uh, That's it's, crazy. It's not every day you meet someone who said they won a marimba competition in front of Claire Musser. <laughs> so this is really surreal for me, and for I'm sure everyone watching this, they're gonna be like, <laughs> at eight years old, I didn't know this. This, this was the guy in charge. You know, yeah. uh, I did stay in touch with him over the years. I would get notes from him. He left the music business somewhere in the mid 60s. He sold the company to a businessman who actually took over running the company and did a wonderful job for a long time until he sold it to further on to Ludwig. I would get notes about once every couple of years from Musser. He lived in California then and he had started a new career of inventing mechanical toys selling them to mattel and you know the toy companies yeah, and so yeah. but he still kind of followed the music scene he would send me these you know little notes about you know something he'd seen seen me on tv or something realized he was still out there and of course his name lives on so i have one more story that's probably interesting uh, now yeah, go ahead. pops into my mind musser started out working for deegan the, the, the mallet company which is gone yeah. now yeah but that was the predominant company in the 1940s. You know, the vibraphone was invented in around 1930. At any yeah. rate, in the 1940s, Musser became the 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 man the plant manager. And the, the story I was told years later was that he had started having an affair with Mrs. Deacon. Ooh. And eventually. <laughs> It came, became a problem and he had to leave. So that he took the tuner and the designer from Deegan and sold yeah. them away and started his new company. Oh, wow. Uh, so the, the original Musser and the, and the old Deegan were, in fact, very identical. And, That's amazing. And of course, I got to know both of those guys uh, when I became a Musser artist in the 60s when I was still pretty young. But that's how Musser came to be a, a new independent company, you know, and he, then he set out to popularize. You know, right. that, to me, that was his big contribution. He saw it as a great branding opportunity and really put it on the map. And you know what's the yeah. funniest thing, Gary, is that you are now the famous person and you are now the important person. <laughs> And, well, and you, you have left a legacy as well, which I think is really I, I would be really proud if that's how it turns out. I, I won't be around 50 years from now to take a look, but uh, I'm I would hope that that's, people still remember. They will we'll always remember you, Gary, and we are always big fans of everything you do on this show as well. So well, don't worry about that. <laughs> and there is the Burton Grip, which I have to say, you know, I didn't invent it. I mean, other yeah. players 
for me, I discovered we're using the same grip. You know, people started calling it the Burton grip, and it, to this day, I'm slightly embarrassed when somebody says it in front of me. <laughs> I always felt like it wasn't fair since I, I didn't truly invent that way of holding the sticks. Ultimately, it became, you know, what was most comfortable for me, and it yeah. turned out comfortable for a lot of other people, too. So you accidentally made one of the best grips in the world, Gary. <laughs> That's no mean feat. Speaking of mallets, let's talk about yes. your mallets, which you actually are going to send uh, a set of mallets to the show. They're actually on their way now, which I'm extremely yes. excited to show these guys. It's a signed one from Gary, the original. They're, they're the last ones that you used to perform. But I also know that these mallets have a lot of history, the whole series. And you've gone through many various types of manufacturing processes. And so can you tell us the story about the development of your mallets and how they got to the stage that they are at today? In the beginning, I just bought mallets off the shelf. Went for kind of a medium hardness. And I'll explain in a bit why, as a jazz vibraphone player, that's what works for me. The problem with all the commercial mallets was the yarn that they used would wear out and get fuzzy and fuzzy and wear and wear and pretty soon you had bald spots on the tips and so on. So <laughs> I discovered that there was a kind of yarn that was 100% nylon. Properties of nylon is it doesn't wear. Mm. You can cut it. But if yes. you rub it, you could rub it for a thousand years that it wouldn't wear out. <laughs> So yep. as, soon as, I bought, as soon as I bought a new set of mallets, I would go to the, we used to call them the dime store. I was kind of a store, like the dollar store, everything was cheap. You'd uh -huh. buy this yarn that was intended for making baby clothes, because it was so soft. Oh. And it only came in three colors, pink, blue, and light yellow, <laughs> like baby colors. So I, I would buy the blue. Oh, there's and, the beginning. And I would wrap my own. And that kept me going for, I'm going to say, till the, somewhere in the early 70s. And I was playing a concert somewhere and a boy walked up to me after the concert and he was clearly what was then a new thing, a hippie, a guy with long oh, hair okay. and no shoes. He was barefoot in the concert hall. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. No and, shoes. Uh, he walked up to me and I assumed he was going to say, hey, you like the music, man, you know. Uh, but then he pulled a set of mallets out of his bag asked me if I would try them. Beautifully made. I thought, wow, you made these? You know, I couldn't, the wrapping was like machine perfect. And I started to play with them and they sounded amazing. I asked him if he could make some more and he went into the mallet business. Mallets were called Good Vibes Mallets. And he had a little set up in his basement at his parents' house. He built his own wrapping machine. But after about a decade, he called me up. Actually, he came to visit my house in Boston. He was Jewish, and he had gone to Israel, as many young Jewish people do, to kind of check into their history and their culture and everything. He came back right. and he said, I was so excited about it that I've made a decision. <clears throat> I'm going to move to Israel and become a rabbi. I said, well, what about the mallets? He said, I'm going to sell it. So I said, how many Ma Gary Burton mallets do you have? And he said, I'll look, but it was about 40 or 50 sets of four. So I said, I'll buy all of them. And I did. <laughs> and I thought it would last me for the rest of my career. Around the, I don't know, the late 80s, the 90s, uh, I was down to the last few sets. And I realized hey. it would be a problem. And about that time, uh, Wick Firth, the symphony player from the Boston Symphony, yeah. was a friend of mine. We were having lunch one day, and he started this conversation about wanting to branch out into mouth. But he didn't want to do it unless he had at least one well-known player that would be an endorser. So I said, I'll come out to you to the factory. When are you going to be there? I'll come and bring you a set of mallets. And if you can copy these exactly, you can make them. So I dropped off a, a set of the mallets. A month later, he called and said, come over. And there was a set exactly same color, same everything. Played the same. It was absolutely perfect. The new Gary <laughs> Burton Vic Firth mallet. And okay. they've been making my mallet ever since. The, the behind the scenes story is that they were actually being made by Mike Balter. Vic had gone to him to say, look, you know, you're going to be the best at making this mallet. You make them and I'll buy them from you and I'll sell them under the Vic Firth name. 
So for a year or two, I didn't know who where they were coming from. Uh, one day when I was having lunch with Mike <laughs> in Chicago, <laughs> and he admitted that you know I, that I've been making the mallets for Vic. So from then on, I just dealt with Mike directly mostly. I'll say one more thing. People ask me why I chose my particular mallet and do I have any other types that I use. Mm. Uh, and I know most professional mallet players have a whole collection, you know, softer, harder, marimba, vibes, xylophone, etc. If you do a lot of studio work, that's normal. You might, you don't know what you might be called on to play at the mm. next session. But as a vibraphonist and an improviser, I don't know you know, what I'm going to want to do next. Right. You know, do I need to get louder? Do I need to get softer? Do I need a different touch? Do I need a, yeah. you know, I can't change mallets in the middle of a solo. So I need one that's kind of the all purpose. So I go for a medium hardness. I don't use graduated mallets because that might be more feasible on marimba where the low end is a very different kind of bar. With vibraphone, yeah. the tone is pretty much uniform over the entire three octaves. I don't need the bottom mallet to be softer or the lead mallet to be harder or anything so I, I like them all the same i also want a mallet that whether i'm hitting softly or really hard that the tone doesn't change right if you use a hard mallet you hit it soft you get a nice tone but if you really slam it you get this clash you know this mm. sharp you know overtone yes. thing i like to have maximum dynamic range when i play I want to, in the course of a solo, I want to sometimes be at my loudest and sometimes at my softest. And because that dynamic range is a major part of what brings emotion and drama and expression mm. into what you're playing. So if I had to play it all at the sort of the same volume all the time, I would be missing out on one of the big tools I yes. have to make music interesting. I want to be able to hit my absolute hardest uh, and have the tone still be, you know, a full, pretty vibraphone sound. It all ties back to your favorite style. And I really like that, uh, that you want something that is super versatile. And speaking of versatility, you have been active for many years now. And you were telling me that you traveled all over the world as you would have as an active performer. And you even visited my hometown, Perth, right here in the 1970s and in 2007. Twice, I know. What are the chances? And I never got to see you. I'm really heartbroken. <laughs> what have been your favorite places to visit around the world? It's probably, uh, most certainly, is Japan. Oh, uh, okay. I have, I have toured to Japan more than any other country. There's a very strong, vibrant jazz scene. Almost all the jazz musicians who are international players go to Japan regularly and so on. In fact, my first trip to tour to Japan, I was 19 wow. and had just joined my first professional touring band uh, that was pianist George Shearing. Within a couple of months of joining the band, he had a tour to Japan. I was there for five weeks. And then I started going back. That was 1963. And then, and, and ever since I go back every year or two, do tours all over Japan. They have you know, wonderful, famous nightclubs in Tokyo and Osaka and other cities. and great concert halls, and so on. I also have had many Japanese friends, Japanese musicians that I've worked with over the years. I feel very at home in Japan, not only as a jazz musician, but this the Japanese culture I'm very familiar with. Maybe that's why I like bonsai trees. I don't know. <laughs> a few other countries are favorites. Argentina, because oh. you know I have a history with tango music. That's all on. Yeah. And, uh, when I was a college student, I got a chance to put a little combo together and uh, all expenses paid tour uh, to South America to play at a jazz festival. Wow. And spent two weeks playing concerts around Uruguay and, and Argentina. That was my first, you know, uh, international opportunity. I was 18. But I came back years later, you know, playing tango with Piazzolla, have a real long-term connection with the music scene in Argentina. In fact, I'm pretty much as well known as a tango musician there uh, as a jazz musician. Uh, wow. I, you know, I've done four yeah. tango records as That's well as a number of concert tours and appearances yeah. there. Other countries that I like uh, include Australia, in fact. 
yes. uh, Switzerland also <laughs> and, and uh, Great Britain. Switzerland because everything works perfectly. Uh, the best organized country in the world. Yeah. And uh, if I could afford it, I'd probably like to live there, except I don't like the winter. Uh, oh, okay. And, and Britain, you know, Americans, we have a very strong cultural connection to Britain. Mm. You know, we originally came from there. And when most Americans, when they're in Britain, feel a connection. Right. And I have that to some extent with Australia. Um, mm. I started touring to Australia back in the first time, was it would have been in the 80s. And uh, I've been back now, I don't know, six, seven times. Everybody speaks English, which helps, although sometimes yeah. I have to ask them to repeat things three or four times before I can understand what they're saying. Because of the accent. <laughs> and, and I like the weather in, uh, in Australia. It's very California-like and so on. Yes. But, um, a little far away. It's a quite a trip it to is. get there. I'll give you maybe four comments that I just want your your first reaction to. So Sophia says, not a question, but I want to assert my dominance. Burton Grip Gang. <laughs> my response is, uh, you know, it makes me feel good. I've explained this <laughs> grip to hundreds of people over the years as a teacher, and you can, you know, explain it in about ten minutes. Uh, in fact, Vic Firth actually shot a little video backstage at Symphony Hall in Boston years ago of me explaining, you know, what it looks like. The first one of your uh, episodes that I saw was you and Teresa uh, comparing grips and her oh, explaining my, and she was perfect. She said this pretty exactly. She's going to love to hear that. Oh, I said, oh, okay, this is, sounds like a good show to keep start watching. Oh, thank you so much. Paul Baker says, I enjoyed the book and have recommended it to friends. What book do you think he's talking about? Ah, this book, I'll give you a secret. I included it in the package with the mallets. Oh, thank <laughs> you so much. I'm excited. Um, I wrote my biography uh, in 2013, planning my retirement. I had thought for years about eventually writing a book about my experiences of being a jazz musician and my world travels and my personal life and everything. And had worked at it off and on, I don't know, for 10 years, you know, 100 pages, and then I'd get bored and put it away. And then two years later, I'd work some more on it and so on. But finally, yeah. it felt ready to go ahead and do it. And the book won an award. It was, it was voted the Jazz Book of the Year by the Jazz Writers Association, which was a total surprise. They had never given it to anyone who wasn't a professional writer before. My editor called me up and asked me, what, where are you going to be on June something or other date? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'll be in Australia with Chick Corea. <laughs> and he said, oh, too bad. In New York, they're going to announce that you, that you won the award. In a way, that was more amazing than winning another Grammy. Uh, after all, yeah, okay. I was used to getting recognition for my playing, mm. but this was another whole thing. I made the deal with my editor, who was a longtime friend. I said, I'm going to try writing it myself. If it turns out it's just not up to professional standards, then we'll start over and you can do the writing. But I said, I want to try and see if I can pull this off. Gary, you're a leader in many industries, not just playing, not just mallets, well, not just expertise, but also in book writing. I don't think there's anything you can also do. get the ebook on uh, oh. Amazon. The next comment is from Matthew Lorick. He says, Dear Mr. Burton, why did you shave the stash? <laughs> oh, my mustache. Well, easy answer. I had a mustache for, I don't know, 25, 30 years since I was in my early 20s. My husband, boyfriend at the time, or yeah. no, we're no longer together now, he said the magic words to me, you'll look younger. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, okay, I'll try that. And uh, <laughs> so then I had nothing. And then when once I was single again, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to see how the try the mustache again and see how it looks, see what I think. By then my hair had become gray and I just let my beard grow out as well. And then I realized, hmm, I kind of like both. So now for the last three years or so or more, I've, I've had this look. Uh, That's good. People seem to like it. So I got a lot of compliments. I like it very much. <laughs> 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 now, next comment is from Jack Buzz. He says, and this is something I would say actually, Mr. Burton, how come you never miss one single note? Seriously, your precision in execution is beyond human. Well, here's the secret. 
if you're an improviser, you know, there's almost nothing that, you know, you can fix any wrong note that you hit. That's one of the reasons that, you know, if you listen to jazz players, you you know, you, almost, you never seem to hear a wrong note uh, because we do hit wrong notes. I certainly do quite a lot of the time, but I, you know, I can easily make it sound okay by what notes I follow it with. The times I've had to play exact, precise written parts, I did a, a project with Makoto Ozone, my piano player, friend, uh, classical pieces, and uh, we would play the original piece at first, and then we would improvise on it, and, and so those were, you know, I had to sweat it, because I needed to get these exactly right. There's no classical pieces written for vibraphone, you know, mm. like with orchestras and so on. A couple yeah. of times I've had composers actually write concertos for me, and it was a real struggle for me to both master the parts and then you know, be very nervous about the performance or recording because you had to get it right. I couldn't, mm. you know, uh, make mistakes and wander around for a while. That's the answer, uh, Jack, <laughs> is that <laughs> <laughs> I hit a lot of wrong notes, but you just don't know it. That's right. There are no wrong notes when you are making the notes. <laughs> well, that's a good segue into uh, a lot of the questions that people asked, which were about improvisation. So do you have any tips maybe for someone who wants to start improvising or maybe anything that makes it easier? Well, here's the story. Uh, if you have been playing, you know, written music, classical music, you're focused usually on what you see on the page, the notes, your part, your clarinet part or your violin part or your marimba part or whatever. If you're going to improvise, you have to know equally well all the harmony and the compositional uh, makeup of the piece. Yes, yes. And many classical musicians are kind of weak on the music theory. Yes, I took theory in, when I was a freshman and I sort of remembered some of it, but mm. I don't think about that while I'm playing. But imagine sitting in an orchestra playing second violin part and not only just playing your part, but also being aware of exact the harmonies, chord progressions, the, the other themes that are going on. That's what's happening in our minds when we improvise. Taking the harmony and the compositional structure and making new melodies in time, keeping up with it. You don't have time to stop and think about it for a while before you resume. It's also a lot like talking. You know, when we talk, we don't think about the sentence structure. We don't right. think about the nouns and the verbs. What we do is we picture what we want to communicate. Let's say I want to tell you that I'm drinking iced tea here. Mm -hmm. So my urge is to communicate to you, uh, you know, about my favorite drink here. Immediately, words start to come out of my unconscious. Iced, tea, glass, cold, you know, drink. And then this wonderful language ability that we have, that all humans have, allows us to take those words and put them into sentence order so that the verbs and the nouns are in the right order and we fill it in with the right prepositions and adjectives yes. and so on. What I'm going to say, I just think about what I want to communicate. Mm. And I say, this is my favorite drink. It's iced tea. I don't put sugar in it. And I like a lot of ice, you know. Me too. So <laughs> that's what improvising is like. We don't mm. think, should I hit a C or an A? And should I hold it for two beats or one beat or an A dominant seven or what? You know, we, we don't have time to stop and think about the nuts and bolts. Mm. That has to be assimilated. Same thing happens when I'm playing a solo. I always say to students, it's like I... As soon as I start to play the song, I sort of mentally take a step back and just lose myself in the playing. And then this inner player makes musical sentences and I watch the playing. You know, it's almost as if I'm watching someone else play. I can kind of tell what's about to happen just before it happens. Just like when we're talking, the melodies pop into my mind just as I'm about to execute them. And if I'm lucky, that, that keeps flowing along. My solo becomes a story, mm. very, you know, logically told from beginning to end, not just a collection of unrelated phrases, but 
something that has continuity. That's sort of the story of improvisation. So first task is to learn the, the whole song, learn the chords, sit down at the piano, whether you play the piano much or not, but slowly hear the harmonies, watch the harmonies. Your job is to help the listener follow the, the movement of those harmonies, understand you know what's so nice about the way this D flat seven chord resolves to the C major. Um, how can I bring that out and help the listener catch, feel the, the same excitement about it that, that I have? It's a really nice analogy of the language, and I've never heard it explained so simply before. I love that. What are some tips you can give to improve mallet technique? Because I know a lot of my, my viewers always talk about, you know, they want to do exercises, or should they do warm-ups, should they do scales? Uh, what are some things that you think are really important so they have a really strong foundational base of technical playing? Because I'm a jazz player, an improviser, I'm very uh, skeptical about exercise type of practice. Mm. Let's talk about music history for a minute. 400 years ago, 300 years ago, in European classical music, there were no music schools. <laughs> you know, you became a pupil a follower yes. of, uh, of somebody who was famous. So you had to, first of all, show some talent. Right. <laughs> uh, and then you had to have parents that were wealthy enough to afford to buy you an mm -hmm. instrument and uh, pay the teacher's fee. There were no exercise books at the music store. There were no music stores. That began to change when uh, the, a middle class you know, emerged in Europe. People could afford a piano or keyboard instrument in, in the house and they... Right for their kids to play. After all, they didn't have television or anything else to teach somebody in the house to play music to entertain us. And uh, so there had to be suddenly a lot more teachers available to teach these, in many cases, fairly mediocre music students. When Bach wanted to teach his children, he wrote the inventions. Imagine that, those were exercises. Yeah. We, we treat them now like, <laughs> you know, works of God. <laughs> yes. So amazing. He didn't write something that just repeated over and over and over again, the way scale exercises are. And if you buy any sort of uh, training book, like the, the Hannon book for piano, scale patterns to up teach your fingerings and, and so on. Yeah. But, you know, as the description goes, it dead from the neck up. There's nothing for the mind to actually deal with. There's no musicality involved, yes, no expression, yes. no meaning, no story to tell. It never occurred to Bach to write that training yeah. material. He wrote, you know, wonderful pieces of music. We've sort of lost that. Now what we do is we <clears throat> start by teaching students the mechanics of their instrument. We just, the main focus is on that for the first learning phase. And then at some point, we put, shift them over to being focused on the music part. And I think depending on the individual, that isn't necessarily the best way to, to learn music. I don't put much emphasis on the, the technique building of exercises. You know, I started playing the vibraphone in 1949, so there were no books for vibraphone, not even for marimba, to be honest. Mm. Uh, in fact, I'll leave the topic for a second and make this point. When I first started playing the vibraphone, even professionally, the Musser company told me that typically they sold 200 vibraphones a year. In the 70s, it was 2,000 a year. Wow. The story was, it's amazing in a way that I stumbled into the vibraphone in a small town mm. in Indiana. Just was sheer coincidence that, you know, this happened to be, end up being my instrument. Now, there, almost every school that has a music department has a vibraphone and a marimba. That's what really made a big change. One of the challenges, by the way, for marimba is that it is basically a solo instrument. There's little, very little repertoire for the marimba to be featured in ensemble settings, almost equivalent to the acoustic guitar, the classical guitar. There's yes. some orchestral pieces, but 90% of the classical guitarist's life is playing alone. My instrument, on the other hand, uh, is usually in, you know, small group combos. Unfortunately, the classical composers don't seem to understand the vibraphone. Every right. time I've heard the vibraphone used in an orchestra setting, it's being played with very glassy hard mallets. 
It oh, makes yes. it sound, <laughs> sound like oh, a, yes. you know, a, an enlarged glockenspiel. Yeah. Um, and I say, God, wait a minute, guys, where's the beauty? This is a beautiful, <laughs> warm, bell-like instrument that's, yeah. you know, lovely. It's not a harsh thing, but, you know, that doesn't seem to have crossed over into the <laughs> classical composer's uh, area. My advice to marimba players is accept that you're going to be making your career as a solo performer. I had a similar situation. No band needed a vibraphone. They don't to this day. They need yes. a drummer and a bass player and a, and a guitar or a keyboard player and a horn or two or something, but no one needs a vibraphone in their band. If I was going to get in a band, I had to make myself indispensable. Mm. And there were two ways to do that. One was to be so good that they wanted me in spite of the fact that I played the vibraphone, cumbersome and hard to move around, but okay, they put up with me because I'm, you know, I'm a good enough player. But in yeah. the early days, I made sure I was the one that had a band to drive the band to the gig. <laughs> and I was the one that found the rehearsal place to work, to work up the tunes. And I was the one that called the club owner about how to, you know, right. unload the stuff and so on. So I made myself indispensable. I said, the only way I'm going to make it in this business is they have to want me. Percussionists, they specialize, there are timpani players, there are, you have to look at where does my instrument get used? It may only be in orchestras. If you play the bassoon, you know, yeah. there's no other gig <laughs> except That's playing right. in an That's orchestra right. or teaching uh, yeah. other bassoon. If you want to get work easy, play the bass. That's what we always say, because every band needs a bass player, and there are never enough of them for some yes. reason. <laughs> anyway, right. I got off the subject, and now I forgot what I was, what we were, what the question was. I was about so technique. My ex learning experience was I got songs and learned them. Hmm. Every new song I learned was a different arrangement of notes and a different need of harmonies and whatever. So I learned music along with... Uh, my instrument right and fortunately with vibraphone i didn't need a teacher to explain correct embouchure or uh correct fingerings or uh how to hold it just right you know you can almost do no wrong with the mallet instruments as long as you don't go crazy flying the mallets everywhere you got to keep them down near the keyboard probably the best instrument for being self-taught and my philosophy goes in that direction and it might be different for someone who's strictly a classical player, I fear too much practicing because I want right. spontaneity to be one of my strengths. So I never practiced a lot. And once I became a professional musician, I didn't practice at all. I only sat down to work on music when I had to learn new pieces, and I would usually learn them first on the piano. I was a piano major in college because they didn't have a mallet teacher. And they said, well, you have to play you can play the vibes in any ensemble, private, required private lesson, you have to uh, choose an instrument that we have a teacher for. Drums or piano, what, which yeah. one do you want? <laughs> and that semester I took both, but drums just wasn't interesting. And the piano, I had always played some piano at home, uh, my sister's piano, because it's so similar to the keyboard of the vibraphone. Mm. So it was kind of easy for me to start taking piano lessons. I was at the peak of my piano ability after when I was, as I left college and uh, it was downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> at least it helped, right? When you have it in college, you have all that knowledge, like you said before, about harmony and you know, musicality. That actually reminds me because we were talking earlier about how you have, well, had perfect pitch. And a lot of the guys were asking, what was it like to lose a perfect pitch? Did it affect the quality of your music, the playing of your music? Yes. Well, it was interesting. Uh, it was confusing, I think is the word that applies. If I'm watching a YouTube video and I'm hearing Glenn Gould play a Bach piece and so on, and I'm listening to it and I, I immediately think, oh, it's in D minor. I happen to see his fingers on the keyboard and I realize, no, it's not. It's, it's, oh. He's in E5, or he's oh. in F, F, he's some, in some other key. And mm. my ears, wow, are confused. It didn't affect my actual playing. Once I was on stage playing, I lost the perfect pitch in 2011. Oh, okay. After 
after uh, uh, you know a major medical operation. It turns out this is a, happens to others. Uh, one of my composer friends is Carla Blay, and she lost her perfect pitch after having dental surgery. Wow. You know, woke up from the anesthetic and it wasn't there anymore. I'd love to explore it with some, with the doctor who is expert in that kind of issue because it turns out now I've heard, you know, there's somebody else mentioned it too, a musician who had been in under anesthesia for an operation and then lost it. And it wasn't the first time I'd had an operation and, you know, been knocked out. And it was the biggest surprise. I was recuperating for two months after that. It was a heart operation. And when I finally was back to play my first concert, uh, it was with Chick Corea, and I heard him noodling on the piano. And I accepted the vibes and started to join in. And I realized, wow, he's somewhere else. You know, <laughs> what's going on? What's going on here? Sure enough, I didn't. It wasn't there anymore. So it wasn't. You know, it didn't affect my career or make my playing any less creative. I don't think. It's just, it was something I had gotten used to and uh, kind of depended on as a, you know, a sense of always kind of knowing where everything is. Suddenly discovered that, you know, uh, that piece of information was no longer available to me. 95% of the musicians in the world, you know, don't have perfect pitch and they, they do just fine. Musicians in China have a much higher percentage of perfect pitch wow. than music, musicians in America. And it's because they think that the, the Chinese language is much more tonal. Oh, that's and, so true. And, that's the, so true. and the, most Asian languages are. And that uh, somehow that's our first acquaintance as infants with sound. So for me, like I said, at age six, that's how I discovered I was had a, had a thing for music was that I I had perfect pitch but before I even knew what it was. I know what you mean because actually like I speak Mandarin and Cantonese and, and I have perfect pitch too. So, uh -oh. so let's talk about interpretation. I have a question here from Therese who you saw in the video, the Bird and Grip video. And she said, to what extent is freedom and personal interpretation allowed to be included when arranging music? And she also said, please share this comment with him. Your grip is the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> in jazz music, interpretation and rearranging is, in fact, expected. I wouldn't, for instance, play someone else's song unless I could come up with a version for myself that is sufficiently different or a sufficient improvement upon, which is, of course, a big difference from learning a Mozart piece where everybody is probably trying to stay fairly close to an original version. Glenn Gould, one of my favorite classical pianists, you know, got a lot of grief for the fact that he changed tempos and interpretations mm. of these established works, but he did it so convincingly that people would say, ah, oh, that's how it was meant to be played, which infuriated, I'm sure, the traditional musicians but in jazz, you know, we're encouraged to reinvent the, the pieces. And so my source of music over the years, in the earlier decades, I would receive music from my friends who were quite productive composers. We were all the same age starting our careers, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, mm -hmm. uh, Carla. So they would send me batches even, six, eight songs at a time. And, and, and things that they thought would be a good fit for my band. And right. then I would go through them and then usually find two or three out of the batch that really resonated with me. But I had no oh. idea how they were exactly supposed to be played. All I have is a lead sheet. I put it, sit down at the piano, put it in front of me and very simply play it. Play it again, play it again, listen to how the harmonies move, how the, melt. oh, that's a beautiful piece of melody there. Oh, that's clever how that works. And so on, you know, get to know the song and eventually mm. arrive at what I think is the, the right tempo for it and the right kind of mood that the song 
you know, I want to think that the song ha should have. And sometimes I would find out later from the composer that it was way different. Uh, but that's what we do in jazz. Somebody comes up with a much slower version than you've ever heard before, and it's magical. Or they give it a different time field. You know, I mm. did it with a Latin beat. You never would have thought of that. And yeah. but look how look how clever it works. And even to the point of reharmonizing some of the progressions to make it more interesting to me, mm. uh, and even messing with the melody here and there to make it flow better. That's just part of being a jazz musician is being very liberal with arrangements. And I That's used to get right. the occasional. Uh, uh, did you have to really change that bar, uh, you know, from the composer <laughs> <laughs> later on? Oh, yeah, yeah, they were glad I, glad I recorded it and so on. So I also got a lot of songs from my band members. I always encouraged the musicians that I worked with to write songs for us. So uh, several of them, Pat Metheny, Steve Swallow, uh, Julian Lodge, Vadim Nezalowski, were very talented writers. They would bring me songs all the time and we would sit down together and go through them and adjust things and you know i would make suggestions until we settled on you know what was going to be our version our arrangement today now if somebody of course i don't do it now but when i was still playing people would no longer would just send me a lead sheet they'd also send me a recording a file of them playing it and usually it was insulting they would use the vibraphone yeah. sound like oh. trying to trying to make it as close as possible to what how I would sound playing. I said, I don't want to know how you Yeah, that's right. Want it. I don't want you how a vibraphone player should play this, you know. Yeah. So I usually didn't listen to that until after I'd already kind of gotten to know the song from the beat. <laughs> and then I would check it out and see how they did it. And of course they would be a different slightly different tempo or different way of phrasing it or something. That's the long answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good answer. I picked up on what you said um, about working with your quartet members when they gave you music. Could you give us an insight on the process of leading and arranging for a quartet? Because obviously you've done a quartet arrangement many times and you would be an expert in this. Like, are there any hierarchies that you have to abide to or does everyone just listen to you? How does it work? For most musicians, whether if composers and jazz musicians, because in a way we're composers, even if we don't write songs, we make up melodies and so on. Our band, you know, is, is a sort of a, a, an instrument for us. It's yeah. how we, you know, take what is our own solo playing and something you can perform. Uh, just like Duke Ellington, my all-time idol as a band leader for big bands, you know, the orchestra, the big band was his instrument. You know, he right. wrote for it and, 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 ma and magically so and so on. He would have been lost without that group of musicians. And hmm. so my band was my, you know, my way of expressing my larger musical vision. First influence... I knew, for instance, when I started out that I couldn't afford a large ensemble. So the, the smart thing was keep it small. And yet trio was too small. So I settled on quartet. Right. And be enough instruments to get enough variety of sound um, and so on. And I, as my model, I was at the time uh, infatuated with the Cleveland String Quartet's you know, recording of Beethoven's Gross Fugue or something like this. Okay. Uh, what appealed to me about the string quartet format was that all four instruments are kind of equal players. Yes, there's a first oh. violin that plays the melody when it's on top, but everybody has an important role, and even the poor lone viola player in there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yep, <laughs> viola. <laughs> always overlooked. That was my concept for my jazz quartet, a rhythm section that accompanied the band leader. I wanted a band that was all, you know, kind of equally important. I also liked the dynamics of string quartet music. You know, they use the full right. range of loud, soft. And I said, you know, jazz music often locks into one kind of medium loud volume level in the whole piece. I discovered the combination of vibraphone and guitar uh, was very ideal. We have, with those two instruments, sound kind of similar. They're both mellow. If you play in unison, it sounds like one new instrument, a guitar phone. <laughs> 
or a top a five star or something. But, yeah. I had the option as an arranger to feature the guitar sound on its own, playing melody while I accompanied, or vice versa. I would play melody and it would accompany me. Or we could play things together and, and with this nice blend of the mm. two instruments that became yet a third kind of sound. Right. One of the challenges, which certainly applies big time to the solo marimba player, is what, and I found it when I played solo vibes performances, how do you play for an hour or two and create enough variety? Yes. Because um, if it starts to sound the same piece after piece after piece, it loses uh, focus. So the trick was making sure that if you can't change the sound of your instrument, you got to make sure that the choices of music are distinct enough mm. and each new piece sounds like something different. That was a challenge, both for my little quartet, but also when I played solo performances, even more so. And I realized that's the challenge for marimba players, because uh, you're going to be playing solo performances. Yeah, you know, all the time. Little yeah. and very little else. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the different ways of experimenting with new sounds and new arrangements, and sometimes they might succeed, sometimes they might fail. But someone here has asked, was there anything you found that was impossible to accomplish throughout your whole career? Something that you really wanted to do, but you could never get to do it for some reason? I get asked that every now and then. Was there somebody you wanted to play with that you, you know, never got to? I've been lucky that, you know, if I made a list of 100 musicians that I admire, I've gotten to play with 95 of them uh, at one time or another either on yes. some record project or jam session at a, you know, on a, on a festival or something. You know, my biggest influence as a musician when I was formative, you know, I was learning my style and playing, was pianist Bill Evans. I did get the chance to play with him uh, on a few occasions, but to my surprise, it was kind of felt, it was awkward. Uh, and never, with, I, I sat in with his trio on two oh. concerts uh, one at Carnegie Hall in New York, where both bands were on the sharing the concert, and the promoter said, "Well, why don't, the, why don't you do something together?" Uh, I said, "Oh, we'd, lo we'd love to." And so it was agreed that I would play a couple of songs with Bill's trio. I could never seem to settle into the time feel, and it felt awkward. And I said, "How weird!" And we tried it a second time at another concert, and the same thing happened. We stopped talking about making a record together after. That. We had been kicking around the idea, but and I oh. asked his bass player years later. I was on an airplane flying to Japan with Eddie Gomez, uh, Bill Evans' bass player. I said, "Oh, Eddie, by the way, I've always meant to ask you. You know, back when I played with Bill and you, before I could even get the sentence out, he says, oh, you mean the time feel?'" I said, "Yeah. What was going on?" He said, "Yeah. He said, Everybody that ever." tried to play with us, said the same thing. <laughs> why did it, it felt awkward. I don't know why. And he said, we just apparently had some strange way of playing together. It was hard for people to uh, lock into. So, so it wasn't just you, which was nice to hear. So I never did record with Bill. The one musician that I had, I wished, I planned to do it and had talked about it with her uh, a couple of times was the singer Sarah Vaughn who was my all-time favorite jazz singer to this day. And she was super amazing. And also I, I got to know her somewhat. We would be on festivals together and chat about one thing or another. And it would come up. I'd say, well, we should record one of these. Yeah, it could be fun. You know, we never got around to it. And next thing I know, she was gone. Uh, mm. So that, when someone said that I regret you know, missing wow. an opportunity, that would have been it. It's funny because Andre actually said Bill Evans as well. So there you go. <laughs> now, speaking of people to play with, have you found anybody who is up and coming that you would consider someone to follow? Any up and coming vibraphone players, perhaps in the younger generation that you are interested in? I don't know all the young players that are, that are out there now. I mean, I okay. stopped teaching at Berkeley uh, in 2003, so I was much less uh, aware of any new students or new people coming along, uh, and so I'm sure I've missed some entirely. Uh, right. I have gotten to know two young players that are the new generation. 
One is Lewis Wright. He's in London. Okay. He's in his late 20s, I'm going to guess. And then there's this Slovenian uh, vibraphone player, Vid Jamnik who uh, now lives in New York and has a master's degree at uh, Manhattan. Both really wonderful players. For a long time, there were two schools of vibraphone, of jazz vibraphone. There was the Milt Jackson model and the Gary mm. Burton model. Yes. And it seemed like players imitated one or the other. So if you played with two mallets uh, in Milt style, you know, that was your thing. And if you played with four mallets, keyboard style, and then you were a Gary Burton follower. And yeah. I've always admired the occasional player that really found a, a, a voice of their own. Stefan Harris Stephon, uh, yep. is probably, uh, he's not a new beginner anymore. Uh, he must be in his mid thirties or approaching 40 yeah. or something now. But I always admired with Stefan that uh, the records that I heard of his, he found really original kinds of songs that he wrote and concepts for his records. No hint of copying either me or Mill Jackson. And uh, I much admired it. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sure there are at least four or five more young players out there who uh, are coming along, who have a lot of talent. Maybe they'll show up on YouTube and I'll see them sometime. <laughs> you've recorded many albums, you've won many Grammys and just one of the most decorated players in terms of recording, even if we were just to look at your recording career. So you must have recorded a lot in studio settings, but also in live settings. And there's a question here from Dustin asking about your microphone setup for live and studio settings. And did you ever pick up any tricks related to miking vibraphone, maybe spots that are better or anything that makes the instrument sound better on recordings? I use three different types of situations. My normal quartet live performing i use two microphones uh, in front of, on straight stands in front of the vibes so the middle yeah. part is open in case i need a music stand okay. and i also I, when i look up i want to see people i don't want to see a microphone in my face um, <laughs> yep. microphones are about a foot 15 inches above the you know the keyboard that works pretty well gets a nice even balance of the whole vibraphone keyboard. And be aware, of course, that my band is not a loud band. It wasn't a loud yep. band. Uh, I didn't have brass instruments and loud rock and roll, you know, drums or guitars. If yeah. it was a loud environment where I might be guesting with a big band or something, then mm -hmm. put the microphones underneath the instrument up between the resonators, just underneath Ooh, the keyboard. And it underneath. gets a pretty good sound, surprisingly. Wow. Yeah. And what's more, the resonators act as great baffles. You know, they block the, the sound Ooh. from the other instruments quite well. And it takes them out of the visual. So if I'm doing television, I also would put them underneath. I never had tried that. And an engineer once on a TV show suggest, yeah, he said, have you ever tried this? I said, well, no, let's see what it sounds like. And it's, wow, it sounded just fine. But that's always the big problem with miking mallet instruments is that we can't get up close to the mic like a horn can and we can't plug in directly like a guitar does um so in, our microphones pick up you know all the other instruments to some extent but in the recording studio i put two microphones about three feet in the air directly over the keyboard but high oh. enough that it doesn't hit my head I'm, it's oh. higher than that and i always used neumann u87 microphones when recording Ooh, German company the Neumann microphone company I tried my microphones repeatedly over the years never found any that sounded as warm and natural for the vibraphone Ooh. as those Neumann microphones now I have been recorded you now in 10 years almost so who knows you know there may be some new mics that are better by now uh, I can tell you almost every every recording studio at a professional level, always had Neumann microphones available. I actually bought two for myself at one point back in the 60s or 70s, and I never used them. <laughs> I was always going to fix up a home studio. <laughs> they were still in their little plastic baggies inside their phone cases <laughs> and everything. And finally, I looked at them one day and I said, you know, I'm never going to use these things. So I donated them to Berkeley. And, oh, uh, wonderful. 
to their to their studio. So they still, I'm sure they still have them. Only bring them out, they said, for special projects. They said we never could have afforded to buy them. So, <laughs> so it was great that you gave us a pair. Caden asks, what is your process for writing a composition? So uh, I know you've written a lot of music and and obviously it's sometimes you want to do something yourself and a lot of the guys who watch this show a lot of the people who watch this show they say i want to get into composition i want to try writing my own music and putting mm -hmm. my own taste into my my performances so how do you do it i was taught uh, composition at berkeley we were taught uh, a variety of techniques for essentially how to develop that could apply to arranging. Let's say you've got a song and you want to arrange it for a large ensemble. Well, they taught us how to orchestrate, you know, mm -hmm. the instruments, how to develop, you know, sections to and make, you know, make a whole arrangement of something. And it applied to compositions as well. So a composition right. starts with some inspiration. It could be a fragment, phrase of melody that you notice that sounds it seems interesting or it could be a harmonic progression that oh that's kind of a nice thing or it could be a time feel as well mm. and then you say and you start messing around with it and then the idea is to expanding on it keep developing it if it's a melody phrase extend it add some more to it and and repeat it again with some variations and and turn it into a you know, a, a whole melody and same right. with the progression. Okay. I've got three chords, but now, you know, I need to keep the progression going, start a new follow-up progression and so on. And pretty soon I've got harmony and melody 32 bars by now. And so I got the basis of, of a song and I go back and rewrite sections to that seem weak and maybe should be better. And I realize I need a contrasting section, which we often in popular songs is called the bridge. We have yes. an A section, and then there's a B section for contrast, and then, and then the A section again, the A, A, B, A. Often it's the inspiration comes from hearing something that someone else played or wrote. You hear a, a little phrase, and I, I wrote one song based on the, a moment I heard in a Samuel Barber opera. Oh. I, I, went, I went to the Metropolitan Opera in New York City when I first moved to New York in 1960s to Samuel Barber's opera, which was called, oh my God, it was a woman's name. Anyway, I've forgotten it now. <laughs> so wonderful. I, mean, I became friends with Barber a decade later and got to know him as well as his music. We, he wanted me to teach him improvising. So uh, we would sit at his piano and I would show him chords and and how we go he was a quick learner by the way right. there was a phrase in uh, one little section of the opera that kept stuck in my mind and so i went home and started messing around with it and turned it into a song and it so it became I, my song was called the sunset bell i played it as a solo piece and that would have been in the um, mid 60s when i was touring with stan Getz. that i remember playing that in fact, there's a, a, uh, a YouTube of us playing a concert in London in 1966 in black and white. It's so old. And one section of it is me playing that solo piece. My approach to composing, sometimes I would have to write songs on the spur of the moment. I would be in the middle of a record project and we would be facing the last day of recording and I'm now back at my hotel room and I'm thinking, you know, what's missing from this record? We need some kind of straight ahead blues piece. Or oh. I need another ballad. There's, there's only one slow piece on this whole record. I need, I need another slow piece and I've got to have it by tomorrow. Sometimes, you know, you would write a piece just based on need. I need a certain kind of piece and it would never be the most interesting piece of the record, but it would fill the, the need for uh, balancing out the, the repertoire. Uh, as a musician, with having some of the most talented jazz composers for friends, people mm. who are incredibly prolific. Chick Corea has written, I don't know, a thousand songs or something, yeah. half of which have become jazz standards. Yeah. Uh, but That's Carla cool. Blay, Keith Jarrett, uh, Steve Swallow, Pat Metheny, all these people who were constantly writing songs for me. So the incentive for me to write was not as great 
I wrote most when I had a new band and we needed material as fast as possible. Uh, I never found composing fun. It was oh. tedious and mentally exhausting. The trick is the opposite. He can't wait to, to get the paper out and sit down at the piano and <laughs> lose himself in, in the, the writing. I think he almost has more fun with that than he did with the playing. Uh, for me, I was so impressed with the quality of my friend's writing that I always felt mine, you know, didn't, doesn't measure up to this. I made a record with both of Chick and Pat Metheny around 1998-99. They both ganged up on me and said, well, I said, here's my plan. You're both such prolific writers. I want to use some older songs that you've written and also write some new something new. And then they both came back to me and said, on one condition, you have to write an old song and a new song as well. Okay. I said, well, promise me, I'll try. I said, but if it turns <laughs> out, I just can't live with whatever I came up with. But as a matter of fact, I actually wrote a song that I liked enough. Uh, I wrote it in the Blue Note Jazz Club in the afternoon while the guys were vacuuming the floors Wow. Um, and I was using the piano and managed to come up with the song and uh, kind of a Latin flavored song. So that was my new my new song for the record. Over the years, I say I write a song about every five years, not like these other guys who seem to be able to crank them out, you know, a 10 at a time. Yeah. Every time they have a record, they write 10 more songs. I say, well, that's <laughs> <laughs> different strokes with different folks, right? Um, this is something that I've actually wanted to know too. Uh, Sean asks, will you ever write a method book about Burton Grip? Now, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is because, like you said before, you don't take credit for Burton Grip. But is there any other reason that you have not written a book for Burton Grip? For years, I thought, I don't think there's a, a book in the Burton Grip. I mean, you can explain it in 10 minutes. So, you know, I don't know what, how you would fill 200 pages. Uh, okay. So I did think for a long time that it would be interesting to write a book and try to include every possible thing I've learned over the years about playing the vibraphone, technical tricks, how to, you know, how I came to terms with the controlling dynamics between the different mallets, why, how it's different playing in the high octave versus the low octaves, the, where to hit, how to hit, what you know. I ended up instead writing a book about my life instead of about the instrument. One of the reasons I, is I talked myself out of writing the book about the instrument because I, this back when I was considering it, I said, well, let's see, how many vibraphone players are there in the world? Two or three hundred? If they all bought a book, it wouldn't be enough to you know, cover the cost of right. printing it. So yes. uh, I decided, you know, probably not a practical idea. I could imagine it being an altruistic idea, you know, a thing to do. And who knows, maybe someday I might think of doing that. I have thought about writing another book. I enjoyed the experience. I haven't come up with what I think is a, the right kind of topic. Essentially, I did a musician biography. Now I could ask myself, what's, what next could I write about? Who knows, yeah. I, you know, I might end up writing it. A murder mystery or something. I murder mystery. Uh, <laughs> I, read, I read a lot. I'm Maybe you should make a cookbook. Reader. You should make a cookbook. Well, <laughs> I should have started something you know, 20 years ago, maybe it's a little, a little late now. Oh, it's never too late, Gary. If you ever release an ebook about how to play Burden Grip, I'll be the first person to buy it. I'll guarantee oh, you that. Oh, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> the last question for today. This is one that a couple of people have asked, which is, what do you think is in the future for the vibraphone? Like you said before, some contemporary players are playing with hard ballads and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But what do you think in terms of even in jazz, uh, improvised music in general, contemporary music. Okay, well, let's start with technique. When I came along, the vibraphone was a very young instrument, 20 years old. I came along with, at the perfect moment in time. You know, imagine you're, a, you're starting life as a piano player now. The instrument's been around for 300 years. There's no new techniques left to discover. Yes. Well, the vibraphone, when I started out, was full of opportunity. Nobody was using four mallets much. Uh, nobody was using dampening. No one was you know, really using it in different kinds of settings, accompanying as well as soloing in different kinds of music. Who imagined 
uh, vibraphone and, and tango music, and for instance, and all kinds of yeah. many doors were waiting to be opened. So right. in a way, I was the lucky one. I got to get a lot of credit for developing the instrument and, and making these discoveries. But, you know, if it hadn't been me, it would have been some other players who would have made the same steps forward because it was an instrument waiting to be developed. Yes. I don't know. I would never, I won't say that there's no, absolutely no new techniques uh, or breakthroughs remaining. I don't think playing with five or six mallets is, is, has a big future. Uh, it's too clumsy, at least for jazz players, it's too clumsy. Yeah. And yes. You to be ready to jump around and reach quickly on the instrument without, you know, uh, a moment's hesitation. So I think it's going to stick with two or four. Uh, as the, the model. But you never know. I've tried four octave vibraphones occasionally. The problem is the same one that also is a problem for five octave marimba, large octave, you know, range of marimbas, which is the, the tone quality gets much different if you go beyond the current range. The three octaves, I think, was chosen for a reason because the vibraphone bars have very much the same tone quality from F to F. But if you if you go on down to C, they get clanky. And if you go on up to a high C, it gets tinny. I even had an instrument made at one point that had went on down to a low C. I ended up hardly using the, the low note, so I dropped it. And I noticed listening to you play your five octave marimba, that if you're using the same mallets in the mid-range and then you drop down and hit some low notes boy they sound much different yes on the low yes. end of the instrument and i'm used That's to right. an instrument where all the notes sound the same they mm. sound higher or higher or lower but, but they don't sound um you know different kind of tone maybe the vibraphone will change technically but i kind of doubt it what will happen is the playing of the vibraphone can well change. That is uh, the music that's made on it. For instance, again, I'll, I'll use an example. Um, sometimes people ask me, how do I get this sound? You know, this, this sound that I get on the vibraphone, it's, it's you know, so much mine and so on. And the truth is, you know, I'm using the same mallets I've always used. You can buy them from Big Firth too. Essentially, it's the same. The difference is my phrasing how I use dynamics and color my playing uh, compared to somebody who perhaps hits harder or has a different style of playing. You know, it's like piano players. I was watching the other day uh, a Russian pianist that I'd never heard of before, but suddenly there's tons of YouTubes by the classical player, and he literally pounds the piano. He's, Ooh, he's like okay. beating, beating the poor thing up. And then oh. I listened to... Uh, other players who, who are lightly, you know, beautifully playing the keys. And I thought, wow, what a difference. I, you know, I was almost brutal watching this guy play. Yeah. So getting your own sound uh, and taking an instrument forward, in many cases in these, with these instruments that have been around a long time, it's how you play it, not so much, you know, the instrument changing itself. Uh, true, with the wind instrument, you get more of a chance to develop your own unique tone. So you can become James Galway, who, you know, is instantly recognizable as an incredible flute player. You know, on the other hand, there are, you know, millions of piano players and tons. I've never seen a time in history when there were so many absolutely incredible young uh, classical piano players. I mean, it's just astounding to me. Even starting, yeah. to, they're eight, nine years old, and they're already so, playing little kids on yeah. and off third, and so on. Yeah, um, and then you see the videos of them when they're eighteen, and, and they they're even more evolved and you know, everything. Always room to reinvent how to play an instrument. Future of the vibraphone. I guess one wish would be that it manages to break out of the jazz box, so that it's right. become more common in. Uh, other kinds of music. I mean, I know it's well known in Hawaiian music, but we don't talk about that much. Yeah. Uh, not much in the classical world, not much in the pop music world. Its whole lifetime has been as a jazz instrument. And all the main players of the vibraphone are jazz artists. 
maybe that would be an area that would eventually you know, expand. Well, Gary, I'm really glad the vibraphone is super bright in the future, as well as its sound. And thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful stories with us. And I'm really psyched because you said that maybe you'll join us for a part two. Ah, I would be happy to, Adam. The questions that people came up with are, were fun to talk about and uh, were very worthwhile, I believe. I hope people you know, get a, uh, a lot of good ideas from uh, the things we've discussed. So yeah, let me know oh. when you feel that, you know, ready to do it again and I'll be by open. Fantastic, that's, that's so, that means so much to me and I'm sure to all of the viewers as well. So thank you so much for joining me on today's call and I will see you soon in another episode. Okay, thanks Adam. Once again, I wanted to say what an absolute pleasure it is to have Gary on the show. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Gary. And it's been really nice to know that even though you haven't done interviews for almost three years, you still decided to join us on the CDO show. That is just awesome. And I'm sure everyone down below is going to be super excited. So if you have anything to say to Gary, please leave it down in the comments below. It's very likely that he's going to read your comment and I'm sure he would appreciate it very, very much. And of course, if you enjoyed today's video, please give me a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. And yes, if you know anybody who's interested in watching more Gary Burden videos, please share this video with them and hit that red subscribe button below to know whenever I upload a brand new episode. And I'm really looking forward to having Gary back on the show once again. So yeah, really exciting times ahead. Thank you so much for watching today's video and I'll see you guys next week with another episode of The Studio. Good night.